All right, listeners and watchers and gluttons for punishment, welcome to uh, episode five of the Totem Podcast. Um, it is still Lent, so we're still bourbon free, but I think if my calculations are correct, this will be the last one before we get back to the bourbon theme. Thank goodness. It'll be the last one, even if you, your calculations <laughs> aren't correct. Yeah. Um, and to the listeners, don't let them fool you. They literally counted out the hours earlier today. <laughs> I think it's 16 days in a few hours, but in uh, any event. It's actually now we're into the 15 and 21 hours. Just, just saying. And it's, Michael, Michael also sent an amendment to God to see if we could shorten yeah. it. Too. So we weren't sure check daylight back. savings yeah. time came into play or not. Yeah, we had a we had a question of when does Lent officially end, and we have a disagreement as to what that actually is. Yes. And did we ever decide? Bottom line is, Michael, I decided when my Lent's ending. (laughs) Noon on Good Friday is when Lent officially ends, according to Michael Castle. That's that's it. That's the day. So, in any event, we have a really fun topic for today. It's probably a good thing we aren't drinking, because I might say some things that I regret, uh, given the topic at hand. But we're going to talk about NIMBYs. If you don't know what that is, we'll uh, explain it here momentarily. And then our, uh, you know topic du jour or headlines in the recent week or so are what happened to the Amazon deal, the monster two plus million square foot Amazon deal in Pittsburgh, which would have been a game changer. Um, Is it really dead or is it on pause and what came to be? So with that, Mm -hmm. what do we know, Paige, about Amazon Fulfillment Center going DOA? Yes. So... It was, it was, I won't make that joke. It was a tumultuous relationship, very on again, off again. Um, I believe in late December. You mean with the municipality? Yeah. Okay. In late December, there was something to the tune of like 55 hours of community meetings, uh, a 5-2 vote in approval. And now all of a sudden, as of... Uh, March 18th, I believe, is when the story hit the PBT. Uh, Pittsburgh Business Times. For it those was watching. It was. They announced that they're pulling out. Um, and out of left field, like nobody even knew. The developer no. didn't even know. And when I yeah. say the developer, the person who owned the property, right? Because the developer is working on behalf of Amazon and was buying it from a local uh, investment group that had the property under contract. And this is the former Westinghouse facility right. that has sat vacant for a very long time in Churchill. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I mean, obviously it was going to be a last mile um, fulfillment center. So lots of heavy traffic. Um, First multi-story fulfillment center in Western Pennsylvania, if not the state. I don't know. I, I'm not 100% positive on that, but definitely in Western PA. Yeah. So it definitely faced... Um, A lot of community opposition, Um, you know, Churchill is is a very fairly sleepy little suburb Um, and there was a lot of concern about the impacts of what that fulfillment center would turn that neighborhood into. Um, So I think, you know, we kind of wanted to use that story. I mean, maybe they want to speculate on why it happened, if it's coming back, if it's really dead, yada, yada. But I also think it's kind of fascinating um, discussing the different viewpoints and the pros and cons of things like this. Um, and uh, you mean especially, the development? Yeah, like yeah. Someone, something like Amazon. I mean, because if you think back to when they were, Pittsburgh was a fi- one of the final contenders for like HQ2, and this city was, you know every city that was still in contention was tripping over itself to give tax incentives and inducements to make Amazon come to their city. Um, And now we have Amazon looking to invest here with fulfillment centers and it's getting fought left and right. And it's not, it's never easy. Yeah. And I think our topic of the day and the real estate topic so are intertwined this time that I think it will run through the whole podcast versus a little bit topic of the day and then a little bit real estate mm-hmm. because if you you know you just mentioned HQ2 so that gets awarded to New York and before they get approvals to actually build it Amazon says time out this is going to be a nightmare we're actually not going to come to New York we're going to go down to um, 
Virginia. And I think it really is because of NIMBYs. So what's well, NIMBYs? I, well, I think originally they decided that they were going to go to two separate locations. They were going to go to Washington and they were going to go to New York. And um, the reluctance of going to New York was uh, a, a congressperson who shall not be named uh, just started raising a huge uproar. And that... I think is what started everything else, where they just didn't need the bad press, especially coming from New York. I think this they probably do a lot of starts and stops everywhere throughout the country, if not out the throughout the globe, uh, for this. So I think they have everything that's in the hopper of this is what we're going to do at this particular time, and then they will get down the road and say, okay, it's time to pull the trigger. And they just look at it and say, okay, we're going to shelve this one now and that one next. I don't necessarily think this particular project was held up by NIMBYs. I think this was a, a boardroom decision that Amazon said, at this time, we're not going to do it. Will they come back? I don't know. Right. Um, but and, and also, just really quickly, because we talked earlier today about lessons in patience in this industry. Can you imagine being on the real estate team for Amazon? Like, <laughs> we talk about the struggle to get any deal, you any mean the transaction. Development team. Anyone who touches those deals. Right. Um, you know, we were talking this morning about how it, you, it's never super seamless, it's never super easy, but can you imagine? Lord. Well, I think that's why, I mean, we could spend a whole conversation talking about developers and their appetite for punishment and <laughs> time and patience but yeah it takes a long time to get one of these things across the finish line but the NIMBYs thing Michael I do think had a big impact in Churchill um, out of the gate I don't think that's why they pulled out at the end of the day but I do think the 55 hours that Paige alluded to was all driven by NIMBYs and the NIMBYs in that sense the local residents surrounding the property in New York you know you mentioned a congressperson um, so for the audience, what's the NIMBY thing stand for? Because I think most non-real estate people, unless they are a NIMBY themselves, uh, <laughs> have never heard of the term. <laughs> Not in my backyard. Yes. Yeah, so, and backyard could be literal backyard or... Anything, any huge change or huge development that's going to impact them. And, you know, those guys come out of the woodwork for just about every, uh, every major development, but... Uh, you know, the Amazons and previously before we ever got to them or the Walmarts and, oh, these stores are going to come in and these this is going to destroy the neighborhood and it's going to ruin everything. And it's on. I'm sure it's come up for any project that has changed anything in any neighborhood. Yeah, even it's down like to a neighborhood ultimate, level, even yeah, if you want I mean, to put a shed absolutely. in your backyard. A lot of like the things, you know, in my very well planned in advance research that I did for today, um, a lot of the stories that I came up with nimbyism or nimbies was referred it was all in the frame of residential development so you know a lot of people are still fighting a duplex being built across the street from them or a triplex um, or a new housing plan An apartment building it, literally anything um, any change whatsoever that's going to occur in their neighborhood there's people that are going to come out against it or for it but in this particular case we're talking about the people who come out against it yeah, and like so, I uh, did pull up the petition that um, there was a group called Churchill Future that fought pretty aggressively this Amazon development. Let's pause um, there for a second. When we say fought, um, when you're a developer, you either have zoning that gives you the ability to build something um, as currently zoned, and that's called use by right. Use by right. Right. So. Um, properties all zoned and it might be zoned residential or commercial or industrial and whatever the current zoning is the local municipal leaders have already said this is what you're allowed to build here and if you do it exactly as this book lays it out that's a use by right and candidly the NIMBYs in that case don't have much opportunity to create noise although they still, do, any, they, uh, they still do they still do um, because their personality is they're going to push even if they can't. But when uh, a developer, in this case in Churchill, wants to do something that is not used by right, 
then it creates a whole litany of opportunity for the NIMBYs to create a committee, as you just described. What was it called? Churchill for what? Churchill Future. Okay. Um, and so they listed off a number of things that were their concerns um, that would negatively impact the residents. Let me uh, guess, job creation. Oddly enough, that one did not make the list. <laughs> Strange that. how that happens. Uh, truck traffic with poor decisions regarding ramp on and off ramp access, uh, using previous road infrastructure with minimal changes, destruction and removal of a thousand mature trees over seventy years old. Uh, a oh, minimum of the trees. <laughs> I mean, I'm sympathetic to that, but also, like, if you triple my property value, it's a conversation I'll engage in. Strong um, probability they were going to plant 10 times that many trees yeah. somewhere else, but yes. Yeah, but maybe on Mars. We don't know. Right. Uh, minimum in increase of 336, oddly specific, diesel semi trucks coming to and leaving the facility. Oh, it, it, they do state the employees with 1,000 to 1,500 employees daily. As a um, negative. We'll say meaning those cars during peak business hours. Heavy more traffic. traffic. Oh, on the more roads. traffic. Right. Um, so more people who could pay a living wage. And uh, most of the warehouse jobs will be minimum wage or slightly higher, not suitable increase to promote the health of the surrounding home values. Which that one I didn't really understand because is it the is it the job, like the value of the jobs that increases the value of the homes? I, how does that work? We can put a pin in that and come back to that. Okay, we'll come uh, back to Increase it. in pollution, um, water runoff issues and sediment changes causing new flooding zones. Um, passing this while only people that can discuss via Zoom, uh, they felt that that was inappropriate. Uh, there is... This is a quote. There is no benefit that this can bring to the community of Church Hill. Please stop this atrocity from occurring. Save your greenery. Save the health of yourselves and your families. And I think if we fast forward a little bit after the 54 hours of uh, public hearing, the vote does take place. The local effect or elected leadership votes in favor of the changes of zoning. I think the mayor or maybe it was the former mayor at the time peduto came out in favor of how great this was for the region so then we are back to this concept of who's my backyard right you've got a western pennsylvania region you've got the city of pittsburgh and then you've got this really tiny area of churchill and then oh the people who literally their backyard would be this new facility um so it gets voted yes but then two months later out of thin air, Amazon decides to pull the plug, and there's lots of reasons why that could happen, but um, it's a really interesting dynamic that the NIMBYs created such a stir. Did not win. Probably were gonna sue, is my guess. It probably wasn't gonna stop there. Um, and I don't know if that's why Amazon pulled out or not, but I'm sure that they were not going to stop at that vote. Um, well, there's a standard playbook that these guys pull out the trees, the pollution, the traffic, um, uh, the impact, the inconvenience while it's going on. It's not going to do what they say it's going to do. And, you know, you pick, pick the, the development, even if it comes down to putting a convenience store, uh, you know, at the corner. Um, they're always going to use the same thing. It's going to affect the traffic is going to be destroyed. It's not going to help the neighborhood. But you take a development of that magnitude, the tax impact of not only uh, the facility itself, the construction jobs, the permit fees, all the other surrounding infrastructure that they would have had to upgrade it, mm -hmm. which probably wouldn't, is not scheduled to be upgraded for 50 years. And then, like I said, the taxing of the employees. You know, you put 1,500 people to work, they're all going to pay taxes. So you can see how any government is going to look at it and say, this is, this is what we want. This is what change has to come. But So, you know, it brings up an interesting topic about who should get to decide, right? Because 
the theory of not in my backyard. I think you've got a couple other acronyms that I'd never heard before today, so I can't <laughs> wait to hear these. But not in my backyard. So I don't know. Was the Churchill Future people a hundred folks, two hundred people, a thousand people? Do I think there were eighteen hundred signatures on that petition that I was reading from. Okay, so essentially a fraction of the population of Churchill. Um, 1,800 signatures, but probably 20 people that organized everything. So there are communities out there, Churchill clearly wasn't one of them, based on uh, the facts that I've heard, that are called referendum communities. And this type of thing, instead of going to a vote of the seven elected leaders, actually goes to a vote of the people, which I don't want to go way too far down the rabbit hole of political here but it is a curious thing is it better to have seven or three or five whatever the you know commission looks like vote on a change in zoning based on the um, negotiating or lobbying of a portion of the population or is it better to have the whole constituency (laughs) Um, are you the developer or are you in the community here? <laughs> I, hey, th- listen, I think it's, that's the whole point, right? I think most developers, by and large, would say when they hear referendum voting, they get very discouraged. Yeah. Because typically referendum voting means you have to get a large percentage of yeses versus a small percentage of no, or over top a small percentage of noes. And it's hard to get people in general, to vote yes for something. It's way easier. Or to vote at all for something. It's, get, right. it's very hard to get them to vote. Typical right. voter turnouts like that are 20%, and they happen to be the 20%. And it's the most passionate 20%. <laughs> the most passionate they just have 20%, the, the people that are all going to say no. Fury in their hearts. Because the other people couldn't care less. But yet that happens to be anywhere between 80 and 90% of the constituency. Right. So. Well, and who thinks about this stuff when they move somewhere? Like, I guarantee you, nobody who bought a house that was surrounding that Westinghouse campus, thought to themselves, I'm gonna buy this house so I have a vote on what happens to the future of the Westinghouse campus. Like it just doesn't happen that way. And these are the same people that are complaining that the Westinghouse campus is now defunct and- Blighted and- It's blighted. Right. And so there's there's no pleasing any of them. Um, so to hit, and just really quickly, I wanted to give a couple more stats of what this development would have entailed it was estimated to be a three well this was in 2021 um meetings that outlined the potential economic impact estimated a 300 million dollar development uh as we said a thousand to fifteen hundred full-time living wage jobs um the potential for 40 million dollars investment for environmental remediation it's a lot of trees and more than $11 million a year in various taxes paid to the borough, um, Woodland Hills School District, and the county and state. And I don't know exactly, but environmental remedi- remediation means they were cleaning up something that yeah. was bad. Already it wasn't already trees. a mess. Yes, this, right. is already, this is taking care of a problem, a tax on the community. Right. And there was another, um, I think a councilman somewhere was quoted as you know saying that the tax millage in that area had ballooned so much that homeowners now are paying double for taxes what they were 20 years ago. Because um, they lost the commercial tax base. Yeah, from when Westinghouse left. Right. Um, so I do think it's interesting. I mean, and this brings me to my question of the other acronyms you mentioned that I had discovered today um, in my digging, but YIMBYs and YISBYs. So I love Michael, learning new things. Michael, that is my favorite part of this job. Um, and I won't say where I read those because then Michael will immediately dismiss them. All right, what are they but again? I need a whiteboard. Yimby, Y I M B Y, yes, in my backyard. Okay. Or Yisby, yes, in someone's backyard. So, Michael, the question I would propose to you because you have very strong opinions about this select few in Churchill who fought this or the people who fight development at any opportunity, would you? buy a house in Churchill that backed up to an Amazon last mile fulfillment center. Would I buy, you mean to live in myself? Yes. Uh, most likely not because I don't want to live in Churchill. Well, if um, it was in but, anywhere else, if it was in Cheat Lake, I know nothing about Cheat Lake. I just have 
heard you talk about it. Really, yeah. Would I? Would <laughs> I, I think it's Would nice. I <laughs> personally buy a house? Next to an Amazon f- fulfillment center. Or if if one was coming to your neighborhood where you presently live, would you be excited about that? The answer is no. I would not buy a house adjacent to a fulfillment center. Now, you should repropose the question saying, do you think that it might be a good investment to acquire real estate adjacent to the Amazon fulfillment center? Including to, houses. Including houses to change the dynamic because of the change that's coming. Absolutely, 100%, yes. But don't you think that most of these NIMBYs are people who can't afford to do that, so they won't necessarily benefit? But they already own the house. So it will make their house more valuable if they want to leave. Correct. But for them to stay there, it does make their day-to-day life, it would make their day-to-day life less desirable. I I actually think, and again, you know, throw me out with the bathwater here, but... You know, I think most NIMBYs are just people that love to complain about change. But that's what I'm trying to highlight here, is if you're just being jaded, as you have self-described yourself, (laughs) and a pessimist, or if this is something that, in, in most circumstances, if you were in these people's positions, you still don't understand why they feel the way that they feel. Oh, no, I understand a certain amount of them feel the way that they feel. But I just think it's a, a de minimis amount of the entire population. I think everyone else that l- looks at this situation that lives in that particular area, they were either indifferent about what was coming or they saw it as a complete benefit. Specifically, we you say $11 million in taxes, uh, 1,500 new employees that might want to buy or rent their homes. And be able to walk to work. And be able to walk to work. Uh, that kind of impact that is going to spawn additional development, that's going to change a blighted area, something that's going to clean up the toxicity. No one cares about the traffic. No one cares about the trees. You know, it was only a select few. And this is, okay, I am jaded. I'm just trying I'm to figure out if you're from, a Yisby. No, no, I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm a we can't Paduto stop. Paduto was a Yisby in this one. Yeah. Would I, would I want a uh, in everything? Would I want a toxic waste dump built next to my house? No, nobody wants that. That's you know, but uh, something that if that particular area is going to change the dynamic of the community, because what else is going to change Churchill if Churchill wants to be changed? Right. I'm just trying to understand. I mean, the people who live in that area um, have children of school age, don't want to relocate their children. Um, they, you know, they're still commuting to and from work every day. Like if I was in that situation, I mean, me, if they wanted to build something in Carnegie that would potentially double or whatever, substantially increase the value of my house, hell yeah, do it. I'll sell my house, move somewhere else because I have that flexibility. But if you have a family and you're, you know, deeply ingrained, you lived in your grandparents' house or whatever, and that's meaningful and important to you, I in attempting to be objective here i can understand wanting to fight that um if it it, if it and this is a question a legitimate question does it ever decrease your taxes or does it just prevent further increases from your taxes asking for someone who hates paying taxes i think if you gave a if you gave a bureaucracy 11 million dollars they're going to find a way to spend it, so I don't think you're going to see things that go down. But they're going to spend it on on things, hopefully, that you'll get the benefit of. Maybe that's Some an of idea that money, in the future. Say, hey, you let this happen, we'll lower your taxes. I think that it probably across the country or the globe has happened. I'm sure yeah. that development has given an authority the ability to reduce taxes across a footprint. But I think... To Michael's point, the lion's share of the time. It's just, uh, hey, your taxes aren't going to go up for a period of time. And right. The initial development is just the tip of the iceberg. Development of this magnitude spawns additional development. You're putting 1,500 people there, okay, on whatever hourly basis or whatever it is. Um, they're going to need a place to eat. They're going to need a place to get gas. They're going to need a place to get their hair cut. They're going to need a place. All these things are going to come because you have that critical mass of people. Right. On top of the most recent news where Pittsburgh is one of the fastest declining populations in the country. So 
again, whose backyard matters? My backyard matters, even though I live 40 minutes from Churchill Mm -hmm. and I'm supporting a business in downtown Pittsburgh. I don't want to see Pittsburgh continue to see population decline. And I would argue that losing a two and a half million square foot facility that was going to create 1500 jobs and all the ripple effect of that investment is devastating to a town that's already fighting population uh, decline, right? So that that's what's so fascinating about the NIMBY. I think they get so insularly focused on one specific thing. I don't want a gas station in my backyard. I don't want truck traffic. They have no ability to think bigger picture than outside of their backyard. But I will tell you that when that gas station comes into that neighborhood or convenience store, the NIMBY's the first guy there getting gas, shopping, because they have the better mousetrap. Newer businesses have the ability to deliver their products less expensively than the existing businesses that are there. You see it with, you know, this is the Walmart conundrum. Nobody wants Walmarts because it's going to destroy downtowns. Well, downtowns were probably destroyed way before the Walmart ever got there. Because you mean in small town America? Not the in small town America. Yeah. Um, it, where the, the same kind of thing. I don't want a gas station there, but as soon as that new gas station opens up, there's lines a mile long availing themselves to the service because it's just a better product. So everyone fights or less the expensive. Tree. Yeah. They want to be noble, save the trees, but then Walmart opens yeah. up. Bread's 30 cents less expensive than it. Absolutely. The They're buying bread Giant at Eagle or the Shop and Save. And yeah. They, I saw so, it in my own family. Yeah, yep. and no, and and that's just it's it's just the nature of the beast, and those people are, it'll be the next thing that they'll decide. Oh, we don't want this now, or we don't want this. I don't know what it is that they don't want, but I think that also they don't want stagnation either. It's just they're kind of against everything, and I do believe that the NIMBYs, they happen to be the loudest, but they are not the most populous. So and. This made me think of something interesting because of all this development and how it does to help to build up a, a blighted area. Though I don't, I don't know if I would describe Churchill as blighted. Yeah, I was going to actually make a caveat that Churchill's probably not blighted. Um, it, I wouldn't say blighted, but uh, it's something that the further development, the spawning of the additional development, will provide new services that aren't there today. In the vacancy of that much property, in that. Uh, densely populated of an area, even if not defined as blight, is a detriment to the community. That, right. I think, is un... Yeah. Um, you couldn't argue that. And right. the introduction yeah. to that critical mass creates all sorts of opportunity. Oh, what um, was the question? If you comment? think... Um, so I'm thinking about like opportunity zones and how now um, there are tax credits for companies that want to do business in opportunity zones and that has been a huge driver of economic progress in those areas and you rarely see people out with their signs and creating change.org petitions for things that are going to happen in those opportunity zones so what's the difference like is it semantics are people like should they call churchill an opportunity zone and then amazon's like shit yeah we got amazon in the opportunity (laughs) zone (laughs) like is I think we just walked into episode number six. Uh-huh. Hey. Opportunity zones. Look Here at she that. is. There All she the is. ideas. <laughs> just going right into it. Uh, that is a great question that is so complicated. Yeah, I, I don't know I, I don't know what uh, economic development incentives Amazon was given to pick this particular location, but their arm twisters are as good as anybody on the planet. Uh, I guarantee you they got tax breaks or abatements or assistance or uh, low or no interest loans or uh, tax deferments. Those guys. Yeah, and I don't, I don't doubt that either. Question. But but the question is about opportunity zones. Like I wonder the percentage of occurrence of nimbyism in um, in opportunity zones, and what is the difference? I I, I don't know of that many large-scale projects that have been done in opportunity zones not that that large scale but even just development in general like it it's um you know i think a lot of you know we have clients that come to us and say like hey if you can find me a building an opportunity zone great and we never face opposition i mean we've never looked for property on behalf of a walmart or an amazon an opportunity zone but i still think that's interesting if it is just like a semantics thing um or a perception thing 
rather than calling it a development project, it's now an opportunity zone. <laughs> well, I think that there's a reason that the government is trying to push opportunity zone development, which just for those of you who are listening and don't know what that means, the uh, government has census tracts, which are tiny little areas not defined by cities, but it's... Um, Think of zip codes as a better way to think of it. But census tracts, uh, based on like the you know census that gets created every ten years and updated every three or whatever, um, and they designate certain census tracts as low income areas. When I don't know the exact thresholds, but if a certain area of a town has X number of census tracts that meet that threshold, then they define that as an opportunity zone. And then the federal government and local governments have said, we're going to incentivize you to spend money in those areas to drive development and drive the economic engine. So one would say, right? You can redeploy monies that otherwise would be suspect to capital gains to put them in those areas and get those uh, deferred immediately a small amount, uh, but then over a period of time, uh, that amount becomes much, much larger. So really, for an opportunity zone, there's less pros for that community and more pros for the people who decide to move into run businesses out of that community than there would have been for the people in the community of Churchill with the Amazon deal. Not necessarily. I, I mean, I get what you're saying, but I think the pros at least the people who created the programs would say the pros for the community outweigh the tax uh, benefit to the developer because it takes an otherwise blighted in the true definition blight um, and erases that blight and creates opportunity i think to your question about why is the nimby population different in an opportunity zone census tract versus a churchill census tract versus say a cranberry township census tract is uh, community engagement. I don't think it's specific to development. I think it's um, if you talk to community leaders of different socioeconomic uh, geographies, the people who are willing to uh, stand up and um, get engaged in the community and what happens in their backyard is just different. And that's not a political statement or uh, it's just a sad reality that I think makes it so if you're going to develop in an opportunity zone the likelihood that you're going to get as strong of a nimby population at the community meetings it's just not going to be there which is unfortunate i think you're going to get some but it's it's almost like that we we, we need this investment and this infusion of investment so much that we're not going to give this as much credence as it actually is and I think if you're fighting for your paycheck and you're fighting to put food on the table, your desire to go to a community meeting at 7 p.m. to talk about an Amazon deal is like totally not on your radar screen. But if you have the luxury of having time on your side, then maybe you guess what? I'm retired. I'm not doing anything. I'm going to go see what Amazon's doing. I might cause a ruckus about it. Michael, I did read some things that, that hint that it's largely people in your generation that are the NIMBYs. The NIMBYs. <laughs> I just want to say it. I, I think it's back to the time availability thing. I and mean, also, I, I mean, well. I'm in this business 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I'm the first to admit that I don't know what's going on at the local planning committee meeting in my backyard. I, I don't have the time between yeah. the kids and the sports and the clients and the employees and everything. People that live time. in those communities don't have, have time to do that. But if you're retired, mm -hmm. no disrespect to Michael's <laughs> generation, and you don't have anything going on, you know, reading the local planning commission means it's maybe not so. Mm -hmm. So many all caps Facebook posts, I can <laughs> see them. Exactly. Uh, but I'm so glad Opportunity <laughs> Zones, put that one on the On board. the list, yeah. yeah. We'll make a mental note of that. Um, Interesting. So as far as the pros, let's just in our minds think about the Churchill Amazon situation. Um, I mean, I guess what, just reinvestment in the community. Not, no, no direct benefit to the present day residents of that area? Um, no, I think there's a lot of benefits to the present-day residents of oh, the area. In, in Churchill? Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Just an increase it's, in property value. In, again, they're they're now the they flip have, of basically all their arguments. Yeah. Almost every one of those has a reaction on the other side, an opposite reaction that is a benefit to the community. Yeah, um, they they would be cleaning up a toxic area and a and a and a blighted area of town. They'll be creating all sorts of critical mass to bring people there. When you do a development of that nature, you have to change the roads. You have to allow them to uh, get new traffic in there and make it convenient for them to drive. So fix the infrastructure that needs infrastructure fixed, that no one's got money to pay for. Stormwater so, management or the, you, their concern about flooding. That uh, it's uh, those are those are all moot points. That's just the standard playbook that they come out with. It's so do you a, think this is a communication failure or a a public relations failure of developers being so focused? Uh, developers and people related to the the transactions or the deals being so focused on certain things that they don't they neglect to maybe properly educate the community like have they published the environmental reports for the Westinghouse campus because that would probably cause outrage in the community I again I think this is a generality but the people who have the time to read it are were already in support of it and the people who want to read it and poke it apart they're the nimbies who are yeah. going to just yeah, I, I so think there's the an education opportunity there but on the I, I, on the part of well, the developers or their representatives. I don't know whether there's an education opportunity. There's certainly a, a, a difference of opinion, and I think that uh, you know the side of the NIMBY is they're going to they're going to use everything to say this is this is how it's going to screw up our lives, whether it's accurate or not. And I do think developers, by and large, do try an education component. I think the rural the development is the easier it is to host an education like session and you know if there's 200 people in the room you could probably communicate to 200 people in a densely populated area like churchill to try to educate a variety of different mindsets and backgrounds and education levels i think is extremely difficult and then bring that into like the city like in the actual core of pittsburgh try to educate people about development i mean i think the denser the population, the substantially more difficult it is to be educating them on the benefits of the development. The and development in a, and in a present day where, like you said, once someone has their mind made up, you can't tell them anything differently. Yeah, forget the it. What are facts? FNB Tower was uh, uh, protested by the residents of the Hill District. You know, they sued the Penguins. So it, uh, it you, you can't get it. But there, I think that's people... a different, I mean, I can, because... It was NIMBYs think, for sure. But yeah. also, but yeah, I mean, who they're fighting displacement because if the value of those homes go up, it, and again, I am, I am very naive to this. I ask questions about this all the time because there are so many different facets that I do find it fascinating. Um, but it's to prevent displacement from the people who have lived their whole lives generation, generationally in the Hill District um, which was a very historically significant part of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's um, history, for sure. Yeah. So you bring in the FMB, and then you have these execs that come, and they want to live in walking distance from the FMB tower. So then, that where do you keep the affordable housing in there for the people that have lived there their whole lives and whose parents lived there and grandparents lived there that feel that that neighborhood is tied to their identity? And I think that's what is very difficult about the NIMBY discussion is that it is who should become judge and jury in each little micro development and micro community. Like in Churchill, who should it have been? In Hill District, who should it have been? It's a very difficult thing. I don't think we are here proposing that NIMBYs are bad or that they're always wrong or they're always right, but I think it's a super interesting dynamic that plays out in the real estate development game at yeah, every and turn. And that is why I wanted to bring up the YISBE, um, because when I do try to think about it, again, I'm not tied to, I do like Carnegie, but I'm not tied there. <laughs> and if someone told me they were going to give me $250,000, $300,000 for my house that was not purchased for that amount, right. I would do it in a heartbeat. But I would also have, I mean, I would have the means to go somewhere else. I don't have kids to move. I don't have a cultural identity that's tied into Carnegie. Um, so putting myself in that position and trying to think, 
what if that were me and what if I had to move my kids out of a school district and what if I lived in a house that had been passed down in my family for three generations? Like I do think that might give me the passion to attend a 7 a.m. board and meeting become an NIMBY. and become a NIMBY. Right. So that's, I mean, I think that's why the yes in somebody's backyard, um, I think that's an interesting acronym because I think a lot of the people who talk disparagingly about the NIMBYs would are yisbies. <laughs> They're I, like, no, let's do is, this. It's, it's, I literally had no idea what a yisby was before today. Well, it's today, the but. same thing. It's just, it, it's yes in somebody's backyard, just not mine. That's the, yeah, that's yeah, the so, implication. I mean, right. It's a... Uh, I think the NIMBYs are the loudest people. The Yisbees are probably the most uninformed because they only look at the pros and just say, sure, that could happen there. That's going to be great for the community. And then uh, the yes in my backyards are the very non-vocal. Yeah. So that should be the moral of the story today. Be the Yimby and approach something trying to see how it could be good for you and good for the community. And then if it's really not... You've earned your right to be a NIMBY. But well, start as a YIMBY. <laughs> start as a YIMBY. I like it. I think that's a wrap. Be a YIMBY. Michael's speechless. I am speechless. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely so, not bourbon. He's speechless yeah. over YIMBYs. But I actually like it. I think you should probably start most of your daily life thinking like a YIMBY. But mm -hmm. in any event. I think... It, 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 that was a, a really segment. good ending, Michael. Just yeah, just I know, it. and I'm going to screw it up. <laughs> it's... If you truly care about the community, when you wake up in the morning, you should be thinking about money. No. What is the community <laughs> going to look like in 20 years? What is the community going to be in 20 years? Is my reluctance to have this project here, does that mean, I don't know, a further decline? And I'm not Churchill in particular, but what is the impact of this decision downstream 20 years from now. I, I, I always have this thing about planners. Planners deal with the moment. You know, we're trying to fit something in under the zoning or so on and so forth. A planner shouldn't even be considered doing what they do unless they're looking at what is the future going to bring? What is my community going to look like in 20 years? This goes back to the master plan kind of thing. But if you can truly say, not in my backyard, is that a today decision or is that what what will happen over the next 20 years? Is this the better thing to have? I think you have to look in the future and say, what is the true benefit to the community? And I, I don't and think I people do that a lot, especially in the NIMBY basis. You right. know, what the developer typically is looking at, he wants to put something there that will be sustainable in the future. This is what this area, I believe this area will be in the future. Not today, because that's why I want to change it. Right. And that's why, again, I agree with you. Um, and I also forget that people can't always see my face when they're listening to this. So when I said money, like I was being, I was <laughs> being a jerk. Um, but I agree with you. And I think a lot of people just in life in general, um, change obviously scares them. But then they fail to realize that a lack of change is stagnation. And stagnate, like, that's never good. It's never a good thing. Well, in the case of, okay, I'm choosing a neighborhood to live in because I know nothing is going to happen. This is a residential area, and it's going to remain a residential area. But if you're living in areas that are, let's just say, dynamic, and change is going yeah, to occur. Yeah, but how would you ever know that? Well, the people well, if who you live are... in a city, you're living in a dynamic area. Yeah, but Something's Churchill was, change. I mean, but a residential But Westinghouse had separate. been there for a long time. So the people well, who true. built those houses, they knew they were building the house by Westinghouse, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good point. I think we continue to find topics that are extremely complicated and we'll never solve in yeah. 30 minutes, but. Would love to find someone that knows more about opportunity zones and has some good stats to talk to about it. Yes, so if you want that to talk about opportunity zones, if that's the place you play every day, we'd love to have you come in. And we'll be, will we be drinking our next podcast? You know it. We will have bourbon for you at the next podcast. <laughs> there you go. And any other topic or guest that you want to see us uh, bring on, we're excited to have you. and. And Thanks. just excited that people are watching. Yeah. That was just surprising, it but nice. It continues to blow us away that you guys are out there listening. So thank you. We hope you have a great day, and we look Be forward. Be a Yimby. Be a Yimby. We'll end with that. Be a Yimby. We'll see you on episode six. Bye.